say beyond that first verse, you can see any of those other verses. <laughs> I even have trouble reading. All right, number 278. Silent.
glad that Ronnie Davis will be back with us tonight. He's going to come and sing a special part. Well, all I can tell you, it's not a Christmas song, but they're all Christmas. Now, this is God's telling me strong. Amen. It's one that uh, the first month. 16th day, 16th day of 2021, I was out with the And this song, the words and everything came to me falling into place. I just had to shut, Thank you. shut the splitter down and tractor down and, and go get my notebooks out on the line board. I was good. Come on. Put me down. What makes this a special? is to me, and I was here a while back, I was thinking on it. After Biden got in there, I was probably the biggest one to be in what the war is going to take place. Well, I was raised from a kid, and I always heard Mama, and even read myself in the Bible, talk about God puts in power who he wants, for whatever reason, it was to chastise this nation. It just, uh, he puts things in place for that. And we ought to pray for the ones in power. But it's hard to pray for somebody you really don't like. Right. You know, but, you still the truth, man. Yeah, well, yeah. this song, since he gave it to me, I wrote it down for him. Uh, it is basically uh, stop my heart. Uh, or being grumpy over. Yes, and it's entitled God Still on the Strong. <clears throat> and uh, it, it ain't every day it applies to me. And it is, and I come up with a lot of people, friends, and they start so they sort of going to that way, dropping. And I let them talk for a few minutes, and we got one consolation. God's still on the throne. Amen. Nothing is possible to me. But this is the first time too many people have heard this song. So we're going to try to do it for you. Oh, uh -huh. 
It seems like 
I, mean, I know that's a false statement to a certain extent, but I can pray all day long for somebody else and continue to pray. Amen. But it seems like when you go to God for yourself, that the prayer don't get above your head. Mm. And I know that's false. Mm. But I do know it's the uh, through <coughs> all these years. You know, Christian people stand in the gap for one another. And by standing in the gap, we intercede with that other person, Christian, that's now. Amen. Uh, and that's what makes it so special. And uh, I've told several different people that I'm real close to that's real prayer warriors. I saw many people lost when they're facing stuff. How, how they can do without God. Amen. But I want you to know, 40 minutes after I come out of survey, put me in the room, there was nothing hurting me at all. And they said, we can lock as well that anesthesia still on you wrong. I stayed up watching Bigfoot movies all night long because <laughs> I couldn't go to sleep. <laughs> Four o'clock the next morning, I told that lady, there, so I need to get up. I said, I'm, I'm, I'm more out from laying here. I got up. I'm telling you, I don't think there's no preaching on that channel. I was head up there. I didn't know how to get to it. But anyhow, so uh, that, when I got up and I had her took my bag and I put some landing bridges on, but I, I just, she was doing her book work right there on the computer. I just stood upside the bed. I just as firm, if you'll rock your feet planted on this floor right here, nothing hurt me at four o'clock. I was not woozy from the operation or nothing. I said, look, I need to walk. She said, well, I'm in the middle of my round. I said, I said, okay, when you get through your round, I'm going to be sitting right here, come back. Greg said, no, we'll go ahead and walk. I don't know if you've ever been up to the North Bowling Service Center. That is, and I ain't never walked. That's the biggest walk I ever took. <laughs> All around that nursing station, come back around. I never used a cane. I didn't use a walker. She was following behind me, trying to hold up with that IV stuff, so I wouldn't pull it out. But I give God the credit. Amen. Y'all <laughs> see, he's still on the throne, and there's nothing too small or not too big. And when you got a fellow Christian to intervene with me, for you.
that her tubes were completely scar tissue. They were closed, 100% closed. Nothing could go through. This was why she was having migraines. This has been since she was 15 years old. She's about to be 29. So she's been dealing with this for a very long time. All the doctors told her the same exact thing. Had my prayer warriors going. My mama had her prayer warriors going. Kara went to Lafayette today and they did the same exact dye test that they did at Cabrini and there is zero scar tissue in there. You can't tell me I don't serve an awesome God. Amen. Wow, that is good, good stuff. Yes, well, man, that's, that's some good testimony. That's a great song, man. And it's, it wasn't just good words. That's good too, man. I'm going to be singing that. I'm going to be humming that. Maybe I don't know what you I'm going to be humming that. That's good, good stuff. And man, what a blessing to be with you tonight. What a blessing to be here. Um, we are going to look at a Christmas message this tonight and next Monday night. Uh, tonight we're going to be in Matthew, and um, Matthew chapter 2, verses 2 through 11. Matthew chapter 2, verses 2 through 11. Let's all stand together to read God's Word tonight. Uh, now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. And when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. What you need to hear there is when the king ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. Mm -hmm. Yes, he's giving everybody fits. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you shall come a ruler who shall shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child. And when you have found him, bring me back word to me, that I may come and worship him also. And when they heard the king, they departed. And behold, the star, which they had seen in the east, went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother. And they fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your many blessings. And God, we thank you for the opportunity that we've had to be in your house tonight. God, we thank you for our time of worship. Uh, we thank you for Ronnie's special, God, and the good song, God, that you gave him. Father, we pray that you would bless our time together. We thank you, God, for these answered prayers. We thank you for these miracles. We thank you, God, for the way you've just undoubtedly touched in so many people's lives. And we thank you for the testimonies of that tonight. God, I pray that you would bless our time of Bible study. Speak to us from your word. Guide us into all truth. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys can be singing. Well, uh, I always think about whenever I preach on the wise men, and I think about their three gifts, I always think about that little kid that was in that Christmas play. And uh, he, you know, he couldn't remember gold, frankincense, and murders a lot to remember. So he told me, he said, yes, they brought three gifts. Gold, Frankenstein, and fur. So the gold, Frankenstein, and fur is what they brought as their gifts, the wise men. Y'all just didn't know that. Uh, Matthew tells us about the wise men. And, you know, man, if I, you know, there's just so much about this story. And I, I can't get bogged down here. Uh, but there's so much about this story and so many things about the guys. I, I just want to say a couple of things really quick. Uh, we did, we, the, the thought that there was three of them came from the fact it was three gifts. We don't know that there were three of them. Could have been two of them. Could have been 30 of them. And uh, the likelihood that it was three, I don't know, kind of slim probably. Um, uh, when we look at it again, we think, okay, then there's the song. Remember the song? We three kings, uh, they were kings. They were kings. You know, they, and, and wise man is a, is a good translation of the magi. 
is you know closer to their you know what they were, and that's that's a good rendering of that. Uh, <clears throat> here's some reality checks. Uh, you know, we call them the wise men. Why were they wise? Because I'm going to tell you something. There were some things about these guys that uh, you could have questioned. You know, I mean, uh, Joseph could have said, "Really? You know, are you are you serious? This is what you did?" And, and y'all are asking him, like, well, what are you talking about? He rolled up in the King Herod's court, and he asked this question, where is the born king of the Jews? Now, that might not seem like a red flag to you, but Herod was not a born king. How was he king? Well, he was king by hook and crook and politics, and by Roman, uh, you know, uh, Roman officials putting him on the throne because he, you know, kissed up to Rome all the time. He was a traitor, you know, and he was a goofball. And that's why he was king. And so when they rolled up in there and said, where's the born king? You could word it like this. Where's the legitimate king? Hey, illegitimate king, where's the legitimate king? And that's what happened. And when it says Herod was troubled, you can please believe he was all of that and then some. And when it says that all of Jerusalem was troubled with him, if you think, well, mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy, wait till that crazy sucker, you know, he killed his wife, killed his mother-in-law. I mean, you can't fault him much there, but he killed his wife. <laughs> you know, he killed a couple of kids, you know. I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. Anyway, you know, I mean, Herod, he's a nutcase, man. Herod had orders for a lot of people to be killed upon his death so that there would be actual mourning in the land when he died. He knew that the whole country would want to throw a party when he died. They'd be dancing on his grave. And so he had orders for people to be killed that there would be somebody crying over somebody somewhere when he died. That's how crazy he was. And you know, I don't have to tell you that. You see it in the Bible. I mean, anybody that would take, okay, all the kids, all the boys two and under in this area, let's put them to death. That is a paranoid man. This guy was nutty. So here's some reality checks when we talk about the wise men. They weren't called wise men because they were rich. And they were wealthy. I mean, let's just call it like it is. They were wealthy. These gifts that they're bringing, that's gold. Okay, gold. Now that's worth some money in any time in any place. All right, Frank. I can't. I can't already say Frankincense. I'm gonna say Frankenstein because that stupid joke. But you know, the Frankincense was very costly. costly. The myrrh was probably the same thing that the lady broke her deal, and they all, you know, all had. I you know, went crazy because she wasted such extravagant oil. You know, just to pour it on Jesus' feet. And so these were very, very wealthy gifts. But that's not why they're called wise men. And you know, sometimes we equate wisdom with being old. And, and I can tell you that getting older, that you do learn a few things along the way. Amen? Amen. I mean, I think figured out now, when you get old, you're going to learn a few things along the way. That you all for dumb, right? I mean, my goodness, if you have a few life experiences, you surely have learned something from them, right? And I figured out why old people are mean. They've been kicked around so many times that they just got in a foul attitude about it. You know, the older I get, the meaner I get. I can see how it's going to come out, you know. And, and so, yeah, that's right. And so, you know, they weren't wise just simply because they were old, because we know young people have wisdom. And we know old people that don't. And, uh, you know, I think about because they were smart or intelligent. I don't know. You know, I can make a case for that. Uh, but I don't think that's why they are called wise. They were not aware of politics. It's not because they're political gurus that they're called wise. Because they walk, you know. I mean, because of these gurus. I look, man. I know you're not supposed to call the wise men gurus. But they had to move. If I have to move from the bill because of something you say in a courtroom, I've got a problem with you, dude. They had to move. They had to flee to Egypt. They had to flee for their life. So can we just say it this way? Maybe these guys, they were not the, uh, you know, they were a little bit careless with some sensitive information. Now, having said that, I would tell you 
that what made them wise was something completely different. Yeah, you know, am I questioning they were wise? No. Am I questioning that the wise men are wise? No. Not at all. But the reason they were wise was not because of wealth or age or politics. The reason that they were wise was because of what they were pursuing. And boy, we can identify in three ways their pursuit. And I can tell you, this is what wise men pursued then, and it's what wise men pursue today, and wise women. Number one, these wise men pursued the Word of God. You know, I didn't know about this until two or three years ago. And I know that makes me dumb, but I'm telling you right now, there is a reason that these boys are doing what they're doing. And it's, it's because they have pursued the Word of God. Let me ask you, how did the wise men know to follow the star? I mean, there's a star. So, the, that's exactly right. You know, why, why were these guys on to a star? What were they looking for a star? What was special about a star? Well, this star wasn't just, you know, uh, something that, you know, but people talk about how they might have been astronomers or astrologers or a mix between the, no, there's a lot more to it than that. Why didn't they just observe the star from their house? You know, if I'm looking at a star, I can go out in my yard. I don't have to come to your yard to look at a star. I look at a star in my house, right? right. Everybody do this. Yes. Like, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> right? I don't have to go to your house to see a star. Right. I can see a star over my house. Okay? And five hundred miles ain't going to matter neither. Right. All right? You're going to make a little difference on how quick that star gets to a certain point. And that's it. And uh, so anyway, you know, they can observe the star from the house. When they talked about the Bethlehem star, they called it his star. We have seen his star. We have seen his star. Man, that begs a question. Whose star? These guys come from Persia. They might be descendants of Jewish people who, uh, you know, they might have been all over the Torah, might have been all over the book. Uh, you got the situation where uh, I think the wise men were pursuing the star because they had read something, just as Brendan said, they had read something in the Word of God. Let me tell you the background for what they read. It's the drama of Balaam and Balak. Bala Balak was the king of Moab, and Balaam was a prophet. And so Balak calls at Balaam, and he says, I've seen what the Israelites have done to the Amorites. And he says, could you please come and curse these suckers? Uh -huh. Now, you ever want somebody to curse somebody? Well, I don't know. That's pretty bad deal. That's a, we need you to come over here and curse these people. Because we don't need them whooping up on us like they did the Amorites. We need you to come. And basically what he was saying was to put the hex on them. <laughs> and we need you to come over here and put the hex on them. And so Balaam said, well, look, man, you can't pay me enough to say something God ain't said and you know, I can't put no curses on them that, that God ain't meant for them. But, you know, we'll, we'll see what we can do. And so he didn't come. He said, I can't come. And so later he said, no, come again. And so this time he begs him even more. And the Lord tells him, well, you can go. You know, I mean, there's going to be some things happen along the way. That was an understatement, wasn't it? Y'all remember what happened? Y'all cowboys ought to know what happened. He got on a donkey, didn't he? Yep. And that was a special donkey. Can we just say that? Can we just say yep. that? All right, so this donkey is here, and, uh, and you know, he gets out there, and all of a sudden this donkey just stops. He's bays up. You know, he ain't, he ain't going nowhere, man, no. And it's because the angel of the Lord, which is who? Who's the angel of the Lord? Jesus. That's the end, pre incarnate Jesus. Jesus is stopping up the way. You can't get by, man. He had a sword ready to put him down, you know. And, you know, here's Balaam going by there, and he's mad at that donkey. I don't know if y'all get mad at your horses. But, you know, he got mad at that donkey. He went to whooping that donkey and went to cussing that donkey, man. He was all over that donkey, man. And finally, after a little while, uh, you know, he gets, you know, he gets by, but messes up his foot on the wall. He gets to a little narrow place, and... The angel of the Lord Jesus, the pre-incarnate Christ, is standing in front of him this time. The donkey can't get by. And so Balaam, man, he just decided, man, I'm going to beat this donkey till it does right. And when that, he gets to beating on that donkey, that donkey, I'm going to beat the donkey this way. I got to pretend I'm the donkey, right? <laughs> All right, so the donkey goes like this right here. What? <laughs> Why are you beating me, man? You know? And I don't know why the book doesn't 
sudden say that Balaam passed out and fell off the donkey right there. And it's like, man, that had to be a weird moment, huh? I mean, what are you doing? Why are you? By the way, he spoke Assyrian. No, no, that's a bad joke. Here's a good joke, though. That's a bad joke. Here's a good joke. Can we just say it was a miracle? It was an absolute miracle when an ass spoke in the Old Testament. It's a miracle today when you can get one to shut up. <laughs> I'm sorry. I apologize for that. I apologize for that. That's like, I don't know. Don't the, don't the donkey represent one of the political parties? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> So they had all this trouble, and every time Balaam gets up there to curse Israel, you know, he gets up there and he says, May the armies of Israel be blessed, and God's going to give you all the land, and you're going to conquer all your enemies, and you know, your generations will flourish forever, you know. And Black Balaam's like, What? You know, what kind of curse was that, man? I told you I'm not paying you to curse these people. And you can't. He said, Well, I can't help it, man. That's what God said. This happened over and over and over again until it just, you know, came to fruition and just came to the place where finally he just like, hey man, let's just pull out all the stops. Y'all got to hear, well, I did not know this. I did not know the talking donkey story ended with the, with the Bethlehem star. Listen to this. Numbers 24, 16. Here's Balaam's last opportunity to curse Israel. The utterance of him, y'all gotta hear this, who hears the words of God and has the knowledge of the Most High, who sees the vision of the Almighty, who falls down with eyes wide open. I see him, but not now. Somebody say, wow, for me. Wow. wow. I see him, him, but not now. I behold him, but not now near. A star shall come out of Jacob. A scepter shall rise out of Israel and batter the brow of Mo and destroy <coughs> all the sons of Tumen. I see him, but not now. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not close by. Oh my goodness, man. He was looking down the road hundreds of years and hundreds of miles. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. Man, these wise men were wise not because they were all that politically savvy or old or rich. These wise men were wise because they were in the book. Amen. And the book had taught them that there was going to come a star. And if the book said there was coming a star, they were, they were staring at the sky. Can somebody say amen? amen? If the book said there was going to be a star, they were staring at the sky. <laughs> Wow, man, what an amazing thing. And, you know, wise men still pursue the Word of God. You know, I, I can tell you all kinds of things, but I'm just going to tell you that I, I don't have time to talk to you about how, how we should all pursue the Word of God. But I will really say this, man. Uh, don't underestimate your ability to read it. Don't underestimate your ability to understand it. And don't underestimate your ability to listen to it. You know, you can download it, you can listen to it, you can read it. However you can get it, you need to get it. And we need to spend some time in the Word. You know, every year a lot of times, let me put this out to you, a lot of times people say, I want to read the Bible through in a year. And here's what usually happens. Usually people keep up with that for a couple of weeks, and then they fall behind. I've been there now. You fall behind. And then after a while you fall really behind. And then all of a sudden it gets legalistic because you kind of done about made a promise, you know, that you're going to get through it and do it. <coughs> then all of a sudden you find yourself reading big, big chunks of Scripture and not getting anything out of it. Yeah. Now I'm going to tell you something. You can put this to the test. Reading the Bible through in a year is a chore. You can do it. You, you should do it. Listening to the Bible in a year is easy to do. Easy to do. And you say, what do you mean? I'm saying when you're going down the road, pick that phone, start off where you left off, you listen to the Word of God. 
<clears throat> you make a trip to Dallas or Houston, you can knock out Isaiah or Jeremiah, some great big giant book in the Bible. And when you get to where you're going, you can say that you did more than listen to country music. Come on. You heard a message from Isaiah or you heard a message from Jeremiah. Read it too. You know, get it every way you can. You know, read it too. Don't give up reading it. But listen to it as well. And I'm going to tell you this and I'm going to move on about this because I can preach about this all night. But when it comes to the Word of God, I find that people are, I find that people are hung up on what others say about the Word instead of the Word itself. I have people all the time saying, man, have you ever heard this preacher? Have you ever heard that preacher? And look, I don't listen to a bunch of preachers because I'm a thief. You know, I don't want to preach their junk. I don't want to, you know, I, you know, if I hear something, man, it just, you know, I, I just play dristic like I just can't do it, man. Besides all that, I've got too much time to spend in the Word to listen to what somebody says about the Word. I'm just saying this. Read your favorite author. Go ahead. Read your favorite commentary. Go ahead. But make sure you spend as much time with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Peter, and James, and Paul. Make sure you spend as much time with them personally as you do with people talking about them. Let's be clear, what they say is a lot more than what your favorite writer says about it. Mm, it's just the truth. Wise men not only pursue the Word of God, wise men pursue the glory of God. They pursue the glory of God. Stars are not fixed, they rise in the east, set in the west just like the moon and the sun. There's a, the north star is fixed in the sky and people may know how to navigate off the stars but basically the stars move across the sky. Amen? Amen. Can we just move on? Alright, so if this star was taking them to a place and the stars move across the sky, there was something unusual about this star. Uh, his star could be translated his shining. His shining could be the translation of his star. I think that whatever the Bethlehem star was, and man, I'm open to your ideal. I'm open to your opinion. I'm open to what anybody's ever said about it. I'd love to know what anybody said about the Bethlehem star. But whatever it was, I think it was a manifestation of God's glory. Amen. I believe that when God comes near, He's accompanied by light called glory. Amen. Whenever God gets close, close, close to people, there's a light that accompanies him and it's called glory. You might say he never leaves home without it. <laughs> his glory goes wherever he goes. And when he goes somewhere, his glory goes with him. I believe that glory is the first thing that God made. Y'all might have feared my litany on glory. I don't know. I can't remember. I'm old. But I'll tell you this right now. I believe glory is the first thing God made. And you say, well, why? why? Well, first off, I think it's the first thing God made because it was so essential. God's fixing to make creation. And he's fixing to make man the crowning act of his creation, the climax of his creation. And before he even gets started, he said, I'm going to make something to make sure that you know that there's a difference between you and me. Just to make absolutely sure that you know that my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts, I want to make something that's my calling card. And you say, well, why would you come up with such an unusual interpretation of that? Well, because I believe the creation days are literal days of creation. And when you read the book, you realize he didn't make the sun, the moon, and the stars until the fourth day. Right. So if he made light on the first day, what was shining? Glory it wasn't Cleco. <laughs> right? So he made something that shined on the first day, but he didn't make any source of light until the fourth day. On the first day of creation, God made glory. And he made it to make sure that we never got him and ourselves mixed up. Because man is, is, is ultimately ready to do that over and over and over. This is like Satan. I want to be like the Most High God. So, he made glory, I think, on the first day to separate himself. And every time he comes near, there is a glory. When you come to Christmas, can we say this? God doesn't get any closer than that. For him to leave the splendor of heaven and come in the flesh and come to planet earth. Wow. Every time God shows up in the Old Testament, there's glory. 
There was glory that was in the burning bush. There was glory on Mount Sinai. There was a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. There was glory that accompanied the tabernacle. There was glory when they opened up the temple. There was glory, I think, in the Bethlehem star. There was glory on the Mount of Transfiguration. There was glory in the upper room on the day of Pentecost. Every time God comes near, the glory of God is there. The glory of God is the light of heaven, the Bible teaches. Amen. There's not a sun or the moon and the stars in heaven. In heaven, the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ brightens all of heaven. Two things about that, and I know I'm getting bogged down here, but I can't help it. We're talking about glory here. Amen. Uh, can I just tell you, can I just tell you that that absolutely proves beyond the shadow of a doubt <coughs> that the S-O-N sun is brighter than the S-U-N. Amen. And you say, well, man, how do you know that? I'll tell you how I know that. The S-U-N doesn't line up but 75 to 100 miles of our atmosphere. And the S-O-N is going to light up 15 times that in heaven. Amen. His light is going to brighten all of heaven 1,500 miles wide, 1,500 miles long, 1,500 miles. You heard it, deep. Yeah. And I don't know if I've heard anybody else ever say this. I'm not saying I had original thought. I'm sure I had. <laughs> but I don't know if I've heard anybody else say this. You always see the light where its source is. When you go outside, you look, there's a moon. On a full moon night, it's not over here, it's over here. You can find the source of the light. When you go out in the day, you don't have to look for the sun. It's easy to find. Am I right or wrong? Yeah. Right, right. When you're in heaven, the S-O-N is going to light up all of heaven, and you're going to know that He's the source. You're going to know that He's the light. You're going to know that He's lighting up all of heaven, and you will always know. Get this, you didn't know this till you came to that. You're always going to know where He's at. Amen. Just look at the light. If you can, I don't know if we'll be up to or not. We're going to know it. Now, I know you ain't excited to get your fish to me. You're going to know it when he comes to your neighborhood. Amen. There comes the light. Here comes Jesus. Woo, man. Clean this dump up, baby. Jesus is coming to our hood today, man. How can I pursue the glory of God? By the way, you're not going to have to pursue it. One day you've got a date with it. Come on. Right. One day, each and every last one of us are going to be before the Lord Jesus Christ and we are going to see Him in all of His glory. Every knee, touch your knee. Every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that He is Lord to the what? Glory. To the glory of the Father. That's exactly Right. One day, you're going to get all the glory that you can handle. One day, when John saw him in all of his glory, he fell to the ground as one who was dead. Yeah. His best friend. Yeah. When he got the glory, he couldn't handle it. Come on. You ain't going to handle it neither. <sighs> Man. Third and finally, wise men pursued the Son of God. Wise men pursued the Son of God. You know, we was talking about Balaam and his cursing of Israel a while ago. Do you realize why that didn't work for him? <clears throat> you can't curse what God has blessed. Amen. You can't curse what God has blessed. You know, this whole world might come through here and it might have choice words for you. You, you might have to take a cussing in life. And I'm going to tell you right now. You can't curse what God has blessed. And when he tells us, blessed are they that are persecuted for righteousness' sake, you can please believe the enemy can't change that. They might add to, they might lie, they might do all kinds of things. But you can't curse what God has blessed. Wise men pursue the Son of God. We don't know if they travel 500 miles or 1,000 miles. It took them months, however long it was. And they were looking for the King, for the Messiah. They humbled themselves before Him. Before he ever taught a lesson, before he ever did a miracle, before he ever did anything, before there was any confirmation, before he died on a cross, before he rose again, these men bowed down to the king, That's right. the king in the manger. And they worshipped him with everything they had. They brought their gold, a gift fit for a king. 
They brought their frankincense, a gift pointed, appointed to a priest, and the myrrh, a gift for a Savior, which was his first and last gift. What we need is Jesus, and that's what they said. Amen. Man, we're after Jesus. You want to know why these guys are wise men? They are wise men because they pursue the Word of God. They are wise men because they are happy. they want to see the glory. And they are wise men because they want to pursue Jesus. They have a passion for Jesus. If we're going to be wise people, we're going to have to have the same kind of pursuits and the same kind of passion. A passion for God's Word. A passion. A date with glory, man. Looking forward to that and getting ready for it. And then this passion for Jesus. You know, I, I'm thinking, I could probably just give me a bunch of Y'all Need Jesus t-shirts and wear them every single week here and at my other church. I mean, how, how else, what else could you wear to be better? Y'all need Jesus. And we know that. We need Jesus. We need to pursue Him with everything that we have. We're going to have a time of invitation. If you're here tonight, you want to receive God's free gift of eternal life, you want to call the altar and pray. Like to come